Hello everyone, good morning, good afternoon and good evening wherever you are. We are so pleased and happy to have uh, Dr. Faisal Shah Khan, who is a co-founder of Dark Star Quantum Lab here with us today to talk about uh, his company and uh, its roadmap. We also have Professor uh, Ahmed Yunus, uh, who is the leader of Alexandria Quantum Computing Group. I think he would like to say a few words first and then the floor will be all yours, uh, Dr. Faisal. So, uh, hello, Dr. Faisal. Uh, I'm really glad to have you uh, in, uh, in Hibitia Series, Quantum Alexandria Quantum Computing Hibitia Series. Uh, we are looking forward for uh, your talk. Uh, Dr. Faisal is doing really interesting work in uh, uh, in uh, uh, Dark Star Quantum Lab, uh, and um, uh, uh, Dr. Faisal. Just very short introduction about uh, Dr. Faisal. His uh, uh, his CV is will, will take very long time to to uh, to to tell, but I'll just uh, 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 tell very short notes about him. Uh, Dr. Faisal is uh, co-founder and chief science advisor of Dark Science, Dark Star Quantum Lab. Sorry, uh, Dr. Uh, Faisal scientific work spanning 15 years. Uh, he produced uh, peer-reviewed scientific papers for developing uh, quantum tech products. Uh, his scientific work has motivated quantum star, uh, quantum startup companies. Um, um, uh, he, he, he served as an advisor for many companies, for many startup companies. Um, uh, also, Dr. Faisal, uh, Dr. Faisal is a pioneering expert in uh, quantum logic sciences based on decomposition techniques uh, for Microsoft Q Sharp, uh, which is based on F Sharp, utilizes uh, the methodologies from uh, Dr. Faisal work. Uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Khan, Scientific Core Guides Dark Star Product Roadmap to support uh, the fledging quantum uh, ecosystem. Uh, we are uh, really happy uh, to have Dr. Faisal today with us. And uh, the floor is yours, Dr. Faisal. Uh, we are looking forward for your talk. Thank you, Professor Younes. Uh, that was a very kind introduction. And Karim, thank you very much. I'm uh, really excited to uh, be giving a talk at this uh, very illustrious um, gathering, especially named after, uh, I think you pronounced it as Hypatia, right? Yes. Okay. Wonderful. Uh, we like, I've typically heard Hypatia, so I'm going to say Hypatia because I think that's more accurate. We uh, accept both, both of them. <laughs> both <versions. laughs> Wonderful. Uh, you know, Hy Hypatia was one of my um, mathematical heroes as an undergraduate when I was a student, you know, some time ago. Uh, Ramanujan was one of my heroes and uh, of course, you know, Gauss uh, and Hypatia was, you know, among them. So I'm, I'm really honored that I was invited to give a talk here. Quite pleased. Thank you very much for that. Um, I'm going to share my screen so I can show my slides and then we can uh, get started. There we go. Is that good? Can, can uh, you see Professor Yunus? Yes, very good. Yes. All right, wonderful. OK, so yes, as, as uh, Professor Yunus mentioned, I'm uh, going to talk about uh, Dark Star Quantum Lab. Uh, it's a startup company focusing on the quantum technology uh, ecosystem. Um, there's some particular emphasis towards uh, defense and space industries, uh, but of course, quantum technologies are more general than that. So um, I'm going to, going to try to capture that. Uh, in my presentation today. Uh, my email address is right there, quantumsheikh at gmail.com. It was available when I made it, so uh, if you wanted that, tough luck. <laughs> it's mine now. Uh, so I'll talk about um, Quantum City. Th this is kind of, you know, uh, something I'll talk about at the end um, and uh, how a circular economy investment opportunity can, can come from that, uh, can come from Dark Star Quantum Lab. And um, I'll build up uh, the presentation with kind of a discussion of the product line, uh, uh, the product line, uh, the vision product roadmap of Dark Star Quantum Lab, and kind of uh, take it towards where it can be part of a quantum city, uh, you know, in the sense of some sort of a small setup, initial setup of a, of a, a small city, uh, technology city, uh, which is kind of popular these days. So let me just get into that. Uh, let me introduce um, the founding executive board of Dark Star Quantum Lab. Uh, <clears throat> our CEO is uh, David Wilkinson. 
is the CEO. Uh, we have Dave De Silva, who serves as the Chief Operations and Project Officer. And then there's myself, uh, I'm the Chief Science Advisor. Um, and uh, we make quite a team, I think. Uh, we have, you know, uh, we complement each other nicely and I've been very excited to work with them for the past six, seven months that I've been working with them. Uh, we also have a, an advisory board, a support team, uh, which consists of uh, Vera Stu, who's the media and community outreach leader. Uh, we have Captain Jeffrey Cole, who's uh, supporting us with, in terms of connections and uh, strategies uh, to, to deal with the airline industry. And we have James Dotson, who's the uh, manufacturing facility manager for what we call the Quantum Garage and the R&D facility. I'll talk more about that in just a second. Uh, if you notice, James got uh, something in his hand. He's holding on to like that. Uh, that's one of the, you know, microchips or, or a little chip, right? Uh, which we like to think is a quantum chip. <laughs> and it may well be, right? Uh, we can get into that later. Uh, the location uh, where we have this facility uh, is in uh, Fuquay, Verena, North Carolina, USA. I've got some pictures here to share with you. It's a 22,000 square foot facility, and this is what we consider to be our quantum garage. Um, so if you look at it, it certainly looks like a garage. There's even a car there and uh, quite a bit of, you know, scaffolding to put stuff on. And one of the things that happens here already is that um, old uh, electronics are refurbished and, and uh, repurposed, actually. So you see some of that action happening here on the top right side of the screen where our CEO uh, uh, David and uh, James are actually working on a, um, a motherboard of some sort, putting chips together and soldering them. Uh, so, so hence the term quantum garage because we want to see quantum stuff happen there. And I'll talk more about that in just a second. Uh, what we do here, of course, is we solve problems with practical applications and certainly electronics are you know, very practical, as practical as things get. Uh, the Quantum Garage is also considered to be the coalitional hub through which we connect quantum technology, which I'm using uh, an acronym for here, QT, and non-QT vendors. So this is all about the ecosystem building, right? So in any ecosystem, you have, uh, you know, you have competition, but you also have symbiotic relationships. So, so we want to focus on that. We want to be a, a, a major contributor to that development, healthy development of an ecosystem uh, surrounding quantum technologies. So let me say a few words about the quantum garage. Um, this is where we do our R&D manufacturing training and operations. Now, of course, you know, in the COVID days these days that we're living through, um, most R&D can be done, uh, I suppose, remotely if it's theoretical, right? And indeed that is happening everywhere and certainly at uh, a Dark Star Quantum Lab. Manufacturing, of course, is, uh, is uh, you know, you have to be physically there, so that's definitely going to happen there in our quantum garage. And all sorts of uh, training, of course, again, can happen remotely, but our vision is to keep, keep you know, when things go back to normal uh, one day soon, uh, we will actually use this place location for training and uh, other operations as well. So a little bit about the term quantum garage. Uh, this is actually inspired um, it's kind of an, a mode of operation, an MO, right? Uh, which is inspired by what happened in the 1970s, 80s, and 90s, uh, you know, with the so-called garage model. And I've put that in quotes over there as well, uh, you know, for personal computing and IT revolution. So there's a famous story, right? Uh, of, of actually stories, but the famous one relates to Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak, the, the two founders of uh, Apple computers. And, um, they used to work in, in Wozniak's garage at home and, and you know, tinker with things, uh, electronic devices and so forth. So the point was that you, know, you, you don't need a fancy lab necessarily at that time, that was the philosophy. All you needed was to buy off the shelf components and tinker with them you know, in a clever way, put them together in a clever way so that you can get new products and innovative products out of them. So that's what inspires our term quantum garage and we certainly would like to follow that. Uh, model. Now, of course, the question immediately comes up, I suppose, for more, many people would ask this question. 
is a quantum garage feasible, right? <clears throat> In the sense that don't you need expensive labs and clean rooms and, and you know, really expensive refrigerators to make quantum computers? The answer to that is that yes, absolutely, right? <laughs> so certainly when it comes to making a quantum computer, uh, you know, you need several tens of millions of dollars, if not more, um, to, to actually, you know, put things together to have a, uh, uh, you know, proper facility where you can build a quantum computer. On the other hand, um, there are certain quantum components, you can call them, that are available even today uh, and have been for a while uh, in an off-the-shelf sense. And for that kind of setting, uh, you just need a garage. You don't need actually a fancy expensive lab. And what you can do with those components is you can actually uh, enhance existing classical circuitry, right? So the circuitry that exists in your mobile phones, uh, in your computers, you can interface that classical circuitry, right? The, the, the ones that's been around for like 100 years now, um, close to 100 years. Uh, you know, you can uh, enhance it using quantum components. Uh, and quantum components would be circuitry that basically has been able to control quantum features and it gives you some kind of advantage um, over classical circuitry. So that's what the you know main idea of a quantum garage is. Uh, and of course, one day when you know things are different and we have some money, um, certainly it'll be nice to have you know some sort of enhancement to the quantum garage where we can actually build our own quantum computer. Uh, but that's for the future. So let me say a few words uh, about circular economy because this is something that appeared in the in the title of my talk. Uh, so, so let's start with non-circular economy. What would that be, right? So this is what people define as a win-lose. Uh, in fact, David Dave De Silva, our CPO, is the one who came up with this definition. Uh, win-lose, low return on investment, incremental improvements to the 20th century technology. And an example he gave was that of electrical cars that we see today, whose fuel resource is questionably better for the environment, right, and the consumer pocket. So, so yes, we have you know cars that run on uh, electricity, but you when you put them to charge, right? They're still using the 20th century infrastructure that's been put in place to provide the electrical uh, power, and that's still environmentally unfriendly. So it's an incremental sort of you know minute difference that you make when you buy an electrical car today. Um, of course, things are you know people are working to improve that. Um, but the idea is that that's an example of something that is non-circular uh, as, as far as an economy goes. Contrast that with circular economy, which is a win-win, high return of investment, 21st century approach to technology, which is both safe and restorative, right? So it's restorative and safe for the environment and the consumer's pocket. And we claim at Quantum, Dark Star Quantum Lab that this is quantum information technology. Uh, this is going to be the technology of the 21st century. People look back, you know, from the future, and as we do today, you know, in the earlier 20th century, and look at how electronic computing came about. People look back from the future and say that 21st century was, you know, the dawn of the 21st century was the dawn of the quantum age, and and it'll be uh, a win-win situation because we'll see some benefits coming out of it, and I'll talk about that next. <clears throat> So let me just uh, get into the um, the, the the dark star um, IP, uh, some I, well IP, and some of the products that are uh, envisioned to come out of that IP. So here first I introduce dark stars philosopher's stone IP, uh, and this is basically quantum algorithmic solution architecture. So an example uh, that actually I like a lot. It's, it's something I came up with. Uh, I'm sure other people have thought of that as well. But uh, this is how I see it. Uh, seawater desalination as a major source of fresh water. So this is a pretty standard uh, you know, idea. It's been around for a long time. It's been put into practice a uh, long time ago. In fact, in the uh, Gulf countries, uh, Saudi Arabia, et cetera, uh, in the Middle East, uh, water desalination, seawater desalination has been and remains a major source of fresh water. Uh, there's a problem with that. It's expensive. Uh, you know, the, the best way to do um, to do desalinate seawater is to actually boil it and, uh, you know, convert it to steam, leave this, you know, salt in one place and then uh, convert the steam back to water. 
uh, that leaves a high carbon footprint because you're using fossil fuels to do that. And of course, it damages the environment by increasing water salinity. So what's the solution? Well, certainly for the uh, reduction of the high carbon footprint of, of you know, current water desalination technology, um, we could look towards a minimum energy regime that can be used to separate the molecules of salt and water. And uh, we have a project called, called Alchemy uh, with a Q, right, which identifies the dynamics of molecular separation of salt and seawater and executes them as a program on a quantum processor to identify the minimum energy and cost implementation of desalination, which was a solution that uh, I mentioned to the problem of at least the high carbon footprint. Um, of course, it'll also affect the, the cost, right? And, and uh, eventually, of course, one will figure out how that can be used to uh, impact in a positive way the environment. Uh, so this is one of the things that uh, we're working on. So, so this is something I like to call quantum computing the salt out of seawater. Uh, it's a nice catchy title, but um, alchemy works just as fine because it also refers to the origins of chemistry, right? As we know today, uh, alchemia, right? So you have alchemy with a Q. Next, we have uh, nuclear fusion on our radar list, a uh, list you know, on the radar, uh, on the list of things to do. And uh, this has to do with the fact that nuclear fission based energy uh, that is produced today is a major source of cheap, non polluting net energy until there is an accident, right? So, you know, of course, it's uh, cleaner than fossil fuel burning. Uh, it doesn't pollute uh, and it produces lots of energy for very little input. Um, but everything goes wrong if there's an accident, right? And, and that's just what the problem is. Uh, the problem is that there's high economic impact in case of disasters, right? So this is an all or nothing sort of situation. And of course, Chernobyl and the more recent Fukushima nuclear disasters are, you know, right there uh, for us to consider uh, where everything was great until a slight, you know, well, it wasn't slight, but, you know, something went wrong and uh, there was major catastrophe that followed. So what could be a solution to this? Um, fission based, you know, energy, which can be quite deadly if things go wrong. Uh, the solution we propose is we initiate nuclear fusion at a minimum energy regime. So um, just a little bit of background, nuclear fusion takes place in the hearts of stars, right? So it's a very, you know, dangerous, very hot, very uh, dynamic kind of environment. And we certainly cannot produce that. We wouldn't want to produce that on planet Earth. Uh, so what, what can we do? Can we create fusion in a different way? And of course, people have been working on this for a while. Uh, the, the issue is that uh, whatever has been done so far uh, does not produce net energy, right? It's extremely expensive to implement nuclear fusion uh, today, uh, and, and the output is fractional to what was put into it. So the question becomes, can quantum computing, for example, be used to figure out the minimum energy regime at which nuclear fusion can be initiated. And again, Alchemy, our, our, one of our projects, uh, deals with that. It identifies the dynamics of nuclear fusion initiation at low temperatures and executes them as a program on a quantum processor to identify minimum energy pollution and cost implementation, implementation of nuclear fusion. So uh, it's, a, it's a grand project, grand vision, but uh, it has to be pursued because the rewards are great. Uh, another thing in the same um, IP is process optimization that uh, we can look at. Uh, supply chain and logistics are the core of a global economy today. And the problem here is that implementing the scheduling of these processes that make up the supply chain and, and the logistics behind it is computationally difficult. So you can imagine like, you know, um, when you're, you know, when, when you have trash day or the, the garbage pickup day, right? Um, you have all these trucks running around. They have to be scheduled. And one hopes that they're scheduled in a way that's, you know, really good for the consumer's pockets, right? The business's pockets, but more importantly for the environment in terms of how much fuel is burnt and carbon is spit out into the atmosphere. Um, very rarely does that happen because the scheduling is a NP problem, right? Uh, it's, it's not something that when you have large cities, 
uh, you cannot process it efficiently on a, on a regular computer. Even a supercomputer would choke up right, for many variables. And so what ends up happening is that you have human intuition that replaces the computational you know, exactness. But you know, as with many things in, you know, that, that, that go with human intuition, it is uh, typically suboptimal, right? It's um, intuition, really. So the solution is what? Well, the solution is to come up with a computer processor that can speed up scheduling beyond what the capability is today of supercomputers. And that's where quantum processors come up. So we have a project called um, Schedule, which, uh, which is with the Q, uh, which formulates uh, process optimization and scheduling problems, for example, from the airline industry. This is something we are working on to be solved on a quantum processor. Sorry. Uh, so, so that was, uh, you know, the introduction was about IP that pertains to quantum computing, uh, which was the, you know, as I said, when I was talking about the quantum garage, the more difficult thing to do. You actually need a, a partner uh, who has built a quantum computer, and, you know, we have uh, some, some partners that we're working with on, on that. Um, the other thing that's, uh, that I was talking about with respect to the quantum garage was the you know the idea that you should be able to do some of these uh, quantum technology related projects in your garage right and so this is what you know secure is about this ip that we have dark stars secure uh, this is based on quantum source uncertainty and the major thing it uh, offers is quantum secured uh, provable security which means that your electronic security is unbreakable and is guaranteed to detect intrusion Right. So anybody who tries to you know, sit on your network or your device quietly and monitor can be detected and apprehended and you, know, you can take measures to, to fix that. Uh, this is based on a project that I was uh, working on when I was in Abu Dhabi at Khalifa University. Uh, it's called the um, uh, Towards a Quantum Enhanced National Security Infrastructure in the UAE. Uh, one of the things we did was that we set up a little you know, closed um, local network uh, which was enhanced with quantum components, and then we could actually have this extra layer of security that um, was provable uh, and uh, also allowed intrusion detection. So a product vision based on this IP of ours, Secure, um, there are three of them that, that come up here. Uh, one of them is called FinTech, and I'll just talk about FinTech. Uh, this is, of course, fintech uh, based on financial technology. That's the term. Uh, we have added a Q there because we're going to do things quantumly. Uh, so this is what we call the killer financial app, and it consists of uh, Sentinel, a standalone quantum secured smartphone, which uh, allows you the ability to actually secure any smartphone. So it doesn't have to depend on your, um, uh, you know, particular developer of the phone. Uh, you can just uh, work with any phone. Uh, it allows users to securely run any app, for example, high frequency trading. Uh, we're focusing on fintech, finance, finance. So HFT makes sense here, high frequency trading. Uh, and you can run uh, any app on quantum computers on the cloud. You can now actually these days access uh, time on quantum computers on the cloud, uh, giving the users superior transaction speed. So think of it as a turbo button, right? So um, quantum computers can give you superior speed in transaction, right? And that gives you an edge over everybody else in terms of you know making money, basically. Um, the next thing uh, I would like to introduce is uh, Coin, Dark Star Coin. It's pr pronounced just like Coin, but with a Q. Uh, it's a quantum secure digital asset. Uh, rather than, um, sorry, it's a quantum secure digital asset and based on the idea of quantum money, which actually goes back to 1969. Uh, if you uh, weren't aware of that, it's quite dramatic to note that some really good ideas that are, you know, just beginning, becoming or being implemented uh, were thought up, you know, in the 60s and 70s. Uh, the, the person who thought up of this idea was Stephen Weisner, and he wrote a paper on this in 1969. Uh, Quine is our planned quantum secured cryptocurrency. So Quine is, is, is the idea of introducing quantum uncertainty technology to, to cryptocurrency. 
uh, coin allows for quantum securing any blockchain and any associated quantum crypt uh, sorry cryptocurrency uh, coin provides a hybrid classical quantum enhanced solution to the problem of cryptocurrency security so there was a, a recent news article uh, which showed uh, or talked about some hackers who stole 2.8 million dollars from a cryptocurrency vault despite the unhackable blockchain security right so the idea is that you know yes blockchain is you know sold and promoted as being uh, you know more secure than anything else it's unhackable um, but clearly it's not right this, this is something that happened recently um so so coin is going to actually mitigate that and um, and provide some quantum security uh, to the problem Coin is designed as a centralized security mechanism over the quantum cloud. Uh, quantum cloud is just the same idea I mentioned before, having access to quantum computers uh, via the cloud. Coin offers uh, substantial benefits like improved anti-money laundering and anti-terrorist funding uh, security. So certainly this would be appealing to, to central authorities and that's how we envision coin. Uh, we don't see it as a as an equivalent or analogous to uh, Bitcoin, which is you know unregulated. Uh, we imagine coin given its, you know, superior power technology uh, uh, to, to be actually regulated. And the last thing is blockchain, uh, again pronounced blockchain, but with a Q, uh, a quantum secured quantum entangled blockchain to work with coin. So when the internet is quantum enabled in the near future, uh, we what we expect to see is that blockchain will allow quantum to quantum information transfer, right? So this doesn't happen at the moment. We we have the ability to have quantum technology, you know, interface with classical technology like my computer, and maybe somebody else's computer somewhere out there. Uh, but the connection between these two computers, which is the internet, remains classical, right? It is not quantum. So uh, I can use quantum technology to encrypt my information, but it has to travel on a you know classical internet. In the future, the internet will be quantum as well, so you'll be able to send quantum information end to end. And when you do that, you'll be able to exploit the effect of quantum entanglement between two computers for security supremacy in the minimum, right, uh, as a revenue source. Uh, there might be other things you can do, but uh, at least we can foresee that much. When that happens, coin will be upgraded from classical quantum hybrid to a Q to Q asset, quantum to quantum causing an underlying blockchain to be upgraded to blockchain with a Q. This will effectively allow um, stronger correlations to be created between data blocks that, that define a you know, blockchain. And um, certainly this will increase security. And with increased security, you'll get more uh, stability and, and of course, you know, more revenue. Uh, so there's of course the, the chance of communication speed is, of, uh, is also going to be enhanced. Um, and these ideas are based on two papers that, of course, came out in 84 and 92. Uh, the 1984 paper is uh, the one that introduces the BB84 uh, quantum communication protocol. Uh, this is something that, uh, you know, uh, FinTech that I just introduced is based on. And the 1992 paper by Arthur Eckhart, uh, which introduced an entanglement-based um, quantum communication protocol. Uh, that will be the basis of blockchain, as I just discussed over here. So, having introduced uh, you know you to the Dark Star Quantum Labs uh, product uh, vision, how do we you know stimulate the, stimulate that? How do we make sure that this is actually useful in a, in a you know uh, in a practical grand, practical sense in a grand sense, right? So, practically speaking, you can do all these things today, right? Uh, you know, you just set everything up, you have your right, you connect with the right partners and it's all, you know, a go. Uh, even now it can happen. But the larger picture is that of a smart city. So here's a smart city picture I stole, I guess, right? I've got the source right there. Uh, it's from coxblue.com. And the idea here is just to show you the, uh, you know, as people well know, perhaps, uh, the interconnectivity of things that happen in a city, right? In a smart city. Uh, there's there's Wi-Fi everywhere. Uh, you know you have drones, you have uh, GPS systems, kind of all interconnected, traffic light signals, etc. Right, schedules, all connected together, and trying to work efficiently together. So so in a smart city, and and this is going to just get better and better. Uh, we we basically see cyber physical system, 
systems and Internet of Things taking over. And uh, the Internet of Things, just a quick, you know, dis definition of this from Wikipedia. Uh, this is the network of physical objects, things that are embedded with sensors, software and other technologies for the purpose of connecting and exchanging data with other, other devices, systems over the Internet. Self-driving cars come to mind, of course, right? Drones and automate, uh, automate, sorry, that should be reading automatic services, right? Or automated services. Uh, the ATM, right? You go to your ATM to get money. If that breaks down, well, you know, and if all of them break down, then there's chaos, right? <laughs> uh, so let's just keep that in mind as we move on. Well, when we move on, cybersecurity becomes an obvious issue, right? Uh, you're connecting things together with this, you know, invisible wiring. Uh, how do you keep the wirings, you know, the wires from snapping or being cut off by malicious, you know, uh, actors? Uh, so to this end, uh, the idea of quantum city comes to the front, right? This is a smart city which is enhanced with quantum technology. Um, where would this be built? Well, we are proposing that it be built in Nevada, which is where I am right now, and you know, nearby uh, Las Vegas. I am in Las Vegas, but it could be built nearby. Uh, but of course, in principle, it can be built anywhere. Right? It could be it could be in Egypt. It could be right next to Alexandria. Uh, it could be in Dubai, right? For example, um, anywhere where there's a will, right? Uh, people figure out a way to do this. And how would one go about doing that, right? So, so the starting point could be, uh, you know, if you think about it, social foundation of a city is trade and commerce, right? You have enough people come together. Uh, with you know the right kind of trading ability, right? Services and goods, uh, but they have to have a common currency, right? And that's uh, or, or this idea of trade and commerce, and uh, that lays the foundation of a city. Otherwise, you just have a small community, right? So you want you want to start with that. To start with that, you want to have some kind of a common currency, right? People don't barter and tra uh, trade and barter uh, anymore. It has to be with respect to some kind of a common currency. So for the quantum city that we have in mind, uh, we propose the use of coin, right? That would be the natural uh, currency for a quantum enhanced or quantum enabled city. We also need a secure infrastructure to facilitate exchange of currency. Uh, this is where the quantum internet and blockchain come up, right? This will be uh, the, the, the backbone, if you will, of all the banking system, right? Uh, and a quantum city. And the rest of quantum internet of things will follow. Right. Um, for example, you know the the crone, right, uh, which is a quantum drone. Uh, we've removed the D and call it a crone. Uh, a crone is also a, a uh, another word for um, a an oracle. That's the right word I'm looking for here. Um, so sometimes crone is actually used maliciously, but often in in uh, you know readings you'll see that the crone is actually a wise individual giving good advice. So it depends on the situation, whichever definition you want to use. But the idea that I, the reason I bring up Crone here is because this is part of um, you know Internet of Things. So so you have civilian use of drones today, right? Uh, people are already using them for delivery services. So you want these to be unhackable as well, right? Because if you can hack these things, then um, you know chaos reigns. So the idea is to be able to use high sensitivity of quantum processes to be in previous to hacking and jamming, right? You don't want to be, uh, you know, working with a drone which actually jams if you send the right frequency at it. Um, so you want it to be, you know, anti-jamming in some sense, and uh, quantum technology offers that ability. You want this uh, crone to be connected to the quantum internet. And you can then process information faster using quantum computing over the quantum cloud. Uh, this should improve delivery, right? How quickly you can deliver from one place to another, and how quickly you can schedule things. So uh, this would be part of, you know, the the Internet of Things. Uh, you can imagine this happening not just with drones or crones, but also with self-driving cars, right, and buses. So this all kind of starts coming together uh, uh, in a quantum city format. So some conclusions, uh, and after which my talk will be over. Um, what are the conclusions? Well, one is that quantum secure tech we are developing at Dark Star Quantum Lab adds the security layers layer against zero day attacks. 
So zero day attacks are these um, attacks that you know even developers of a product may not be aware of, right? It's just something that some malicious hacker by design or totally by coincidence comes up with uh, or realizes or notices, then stays quiet until the zero day arrives and you know makes the attack and then just you know chaos rules again. So having this quantum security uh, layer on top can prevent those sorts of attacks from occurring and causing all sorts of uh, economic loss and possibly worse. Hybrid classical quantum tech can be assembled in a garage. So this is the, you know, if, if anything uh, at all from this talk you take away, it should be this, right? Uh, there are already things available out there that you can take and, you know, wed them or mate them or interface them with your existing technology, like, you know, your mobile phone and, and have a hybrid like in between classical quantum technology, and, and you can take advantage of that. Uh, this tech can be quantum secured and used with greater security over the internet. And uh, there is an app development industry waiting to produce apps for quantum, right? So of course, when you start doing these hybrid classical quantum technologies, you want applications that will be able to exploit or utilize the, the quantum enhancements you provide. So yeah, I mean, uh, there's just a whole industry waiting right there for, for um, you know, from an app development point of view. And uh, that is all uh, that I had to share with you uh, today, tonight for me. And I'll leave my email here again. I think it's a pretty cool email address. <laughs> so please do send me an email if you have further questions. Back to you, Professor Ahmed Karim. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Faisal, for this very interesting and inspiring talks. Actually, I have a list of questions. I'm, I'm writing all the five questions. But awesome. I will leave the, the floor for the uh, attendees now to ask. I, I can see that we have many questions as well. So, uh, uh, Karim, can you help to unmute? Um, okay, I think that uh, Mr. Uh, Ahmed either can actually um, can actually unmute himself right now. Okay, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Please. Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Um, okay. First of all, uh, thank you, Karim, and thank you, Professor Ahmed Yunus, for uh, hosting uh, such a series of events uh, for introducing quantum computing and quantum technology to most of the people. Uh, I'm really grateful for that. And uh, thank you, Professor Faisal, uh, for uh, uh, this uh, uh, informative uh, presentation that you gave us and this introductory about uh, the dark star quantum lab and uh, what 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 is the contribution uh, and what the contribution is uh, uh, quantum uh, dark star lab uh, is given to the uh, to the global community uh, but actually I have a question uh, this question is about um, actually there are there are two questions uh, the first question is uh, uh, how 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 can you deploy the quantum technology to to such like a broad sector of of technologies like uh, cloud computing or blockchain, uh, especially blockchain because it's a it's a newly uh, emerging uh, technology. It's not well known until now. Uh, uh, so h how can you deploy such technology? How how can you make such merge between such two? Um, to new technologies, uh, and I mean here by new technologies, uh, like um, we can implement them, we can like, we can feel them, um, not just theoretical, but in the practical life. Um, that's the first question. Uh, the second question: um, How 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 did uh, Dark Star um, convinced uh, the governments uh, to like? Uh, to, to build such uh, solutions using quantum technology. Uh, and yeah, that's it. Thank you. OK, very good questions. Thank you. Uh, to address the first one, uh, I guess there's a, you know, one way to sort of answer that uh, first question of yours is to say that, um, you know, there's an advantage uh, in going after relatively new technologies like blockchain, right? Um, in the sense that if you if they're relatively new, then they're not ubiquitous, and you can actually add something onto them right now, and you get a better version delivered to the masses, right? Uh, in in, a, in in that sense, so <clears throat> if you can convince 
<coughs> the adopters of blockchain, <coughs> excuse me, and the developers of blockchain that uh, you know quantum technology can actually offer a business advantage because that's what they're really after at the end of the day, right? These are businesses. Uh, then there should be no reason why they wouldn't want to adopt, right? Uh, and um, for instance, I think in Canada, um, it's one of Professor Yunus's favorite country because <laughs> uh, they support quantum computing at the governmental level. Um, and indeed, th there's a city, uh, the same city that actually our CPO, Dave De Silva, lives in. And I think he was involved in this uh, effort. <laughs> The city is accepting um, stable coins, and there might in fact be bitcoins or, or some other, uh, you know, crypto coins, cryptocurrency, as a way to pay your taxes. So, so you know, I guess I'm also answering your second question: How do you convince the government? You just have to be the right person, right, uh, to to tell them, hey, this is a there's a facility there. Uh, ultimately, you know, governments and businesses are, are the bottom line is about making money and delivering a service that is going to save money in the long term, certainly with the you know, case of the government. Uh, and the government has to be able to see that, right? Uh, I mean, depends on which what, what the government's uh, vision is, but it should be fairly straightforward to do that. Uh, I'm not saying it's going to be easy, but uh, it should be fairly straightforward to show them that there's a tangible advantage of quantum technology, right? And, uh, and 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 I think you admitted that that's already happening. You know, you can already see technology uh, advantages uh, for quantum. So uh, I think we have uh, another question from Mariam. Yes, uh, I think she can unmute herself. Yes. Uh, hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, we can hear you. OK. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Pfizer, for this presentation. Uh, personally, I learned a lot from uh, like about applications of uh, quantum computing in many fields. Uh, I wanted to ask a question about um, quantum game theory. I, actually, I assisted your previous talk about uh, quantum game theory. And my question is that are you using now this theory in uh, in the process optimization within your company now? And if so, uh, can you give us some details about like, how you're applying uh, game theory to uh, optimize processes? Thank you. Sure. Very nice question, uh, Mariam. Thank you. Um, okay. So first of all, um, uh, y y uh, we, so we are applying quantum game theory at Dark Star Quantum Lab. Uh, but more so towards um, high frequency trading. So uh, not so much towards process optimization yet, right? Uh, the reason for that is that uh, process optimization using quantum processors, right? The the problems are um, that come to you. So it depends on which quantum processor you use. Uh, my personal bias right now is towards uh, D-Wave, <laughs> quantum annealer. Uh, right. On, well, pr probably because that's something I have worked with before. I've programmed it, uh, but also I think, and this is my personal opinion. I could be wrong. My feeling is that it's the it's the one that actually delivers most commercially speaking. Um, so from that point of view, uh, you know, when I use that processor uh, in an indirect way, we're using quantum game theory, but we haven't made it explicit. Or, or, you know, which means that there's probably some room for improvement for the process optimization, as you pointed out. Uh, but we haven't done that yet. Uh, but on the other hand, we are using uh, quantum game theory for high frequency trading, which actually is in line with the other IP at Darkstar, which is uh, quantum uncertainty, and from which we have the blockchain and the coin, uh, you know, and the Sentinel uh, smartphone, quantum enhanced smartphone coming out. And so the idea is that you know you you um, think of the idea that you know in the near future when you have quantum internet as well, and you have two devices which are quantum enabled, two quantum computers, they'll be playing a game right with each other when they trade right, and the trading would be high frequency because these are quantum machines right. Uh, so the right model to study that process and take advantage of it would be quantum game theory. So um, look out for my paper that I'm working with uh, Professor or uh, Dr. Ning Bao uh, in the near future. 
Okay, thank you so much. And are there any um, projects about uh, quantum machine learning in the future? Uh, certainly, uh, but uh, part of the, the, the you know, projects or the uh, product line at Darkstar is driven by what the market tells us. So we were told by, you know, when we started the whole process six months ago, we started talking to people, you know, back and forth, and Dave De Silva was indispensable in, in doing that. Uh, and the feedback was that, you know, the emphasis is on fintech, the financial sector, and, uh, you know, scheduling and optimization. So, so that's kind of what we've been looking at. Now, within both of these uh, areas, there's room for improvement using machine learning ideas, right? So quantum machine learning. Uh, but at the moment, we haven't looked into that. But that doesn't mean that they're excluded. It's just that we haven't been told to engage in that at the moment. Thank you so much. So clear. My pleasure. So uh, I can't see any more questions right now. Please, if you have any question, please raise your hand or write your question on, on, on the comment on the chat. Um, and this leaves me the chance to ask my many questions until someone asks. Uh -oh. uh, actually, <laughs> I, I, uh, um, I have to mention that it is not an easy task to insert Q in the right position uh, in, in the world. <laughs> so this is this is the, the art of selecting the projects, uh, the, the, the position of Q. I think this is a different project we have to work on. Um, uh, actually, uh, um, I, I have a question about El, El, El Kemi uh, project uh, for the nuclear uh, fusion and water desalination. Uh, you mentioned you are trying to solve um, these problems using quantum computers. Uh, why can't we solve them uh, on classical computer? Is it, is it complexity only or is there any other issues to, to not to be able to solve on, on classical computer? Right. Uh, no, ultimately um, it is just complexity. And uh, so I should uh, give some uh, academic background to this. Uh, there was some really good work that came out, I think 2011 or 2012 from Harvard University and the work was uh, of James Whitfield, uh, who's actually a professor at Purdue right now, uh, Purdue University, I think. But uh, James Whitfield uh, is, uh, is a gentleman's name, and his dissertation was about giving a computational perspective to chemistry, in particular the quantum questions that come up in chemistry, right? And uh, that's where I got this idea from, you know, that, you know, this is this desalination, for example, and fusion, these are all quantum chemistry problems, right? And um, uh, if you look at James's work, uh, this is exactly the claim he was making, you know, this, this whole dissertation he has put together very nicely, that the, 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 comp the complexity of the problem of the molecular, you know, this description of the molecules, for example, becomes so complicated and this was verified by my colleague at Khalifa University, who was a chemist at that time. Uh, well, not at that time, a few years ago. Uh, that yes, it's it just the, the classical computers, be they supercomputers, they just choke up. Uh, it's a lot of information. And so uh, the idea goes back then to Richard Feynman's, uh, I think, proposal several decades back. Uh, his idea was that you wanted, he wanted a quantum computer to do exactly quantum physics and quantum chemistry, which is hard to do on classical computers. So to, to address your question, uh, Professor Yunus, yes, it's a comp you know, computational complexity problem, which is why yeah, So this, this, is, uh, uh, this is an algorithmic solution. You are trying to find an algorithmic solution for this problem. Exactly. Quantum algorithmic solution. Quantum algorithm. With the queue. <laughs> with the queue. <laughs> yeah. In very... fact, I was, I was joking with uh, some of my friends that, you know, uh, Q is supposed to be PAF, right, in Arabic? With a, with a D, yes. it's not... Quantum, quantum, kumumi, kef, yes. Kef. We should say quantum, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so they were surprised that there's a, you know, different uh, ka sound and two different sounds in Arabic. So uh, we were just having some fun with that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, very good. Um, so, okay, I have one, uh, another question uh, about... Um, you told, uh, you showed us um, a picture from the, your quantum garage. Um, 
and you mentioned his uh, old motherboard you are doing something uh, with it related to quantum computing so can you give us short notes about this because uh, uh, i have many old motherboards and it, it will be useful to use uh, on something related to quantum computing certainly um so what they were doing was basically um so that picture, to be to be honest, was just a decoy, right? It, it, was, a, it, was, it was there was nothing really happening. They were just taking a picture, right? Okay. <laughs> uh, but but what uh, that picture is meant to convey is the idea that you can take, uh, you know. So what happens right now is that today, uh, quantum random number generators. These are random number generators that use quantum mechanisms as uh, you know as a source of entropy. Uh, you have people have been able to put them on a chip, like a microchip, right? So, so they're this big, literally, uh, and uh, they can be actually interfaced with classical components. So, the first thing people came up with was uh, a mobile phone because you know everybody's got one today and they're on the move. So, Samsung, in fact, uh, has a Samsung Galaxy uh, Quantum, I think is what it's called. Uh, they've taken that one of these QRNG chips and they've put this in a line of Galaxy phones, but they're only for sale in South Korea at the moment. Right. But uh, what we're trying to do in some sense is we're trying to do the same thing, right? Uh, here in the United States, uh, but we want to go beyond. We want to also have a vision of what we can do with that phone once we have that chip in there, right? And then that's what the you know whole discussion about fintech was. But uh, going back to, to what you were asking, uh, the, the sky is the limit in some sense, right? I mean, you take your uh, old you know, board and you figure out what it does. And if there's any sort of randomness needed to make it function better, you cannot do that today in your garage. It's, you know, you should, all you need is a, a little bit of you know, understanding of electronic components, a soldering gun, <laughs> and you just put it together. And imagination. And imagination, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Very, very. Thank you very much for this uh, this uh, answer. Uh, so, uh, before I continue with my list of questions, is there anyone <laughs> has a question? Please write on on the chat or raise your hand. This is very good on for for me because I, I'd like <laughs> to ask another question. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, so about the uh, your product vision in, in, in Dark Star Quantum Lab. Um, what's, what's, um, do you have any uh, products near uh, to, to, to the market, to, to be sold on the market, to be promoted? So what uh, um, uh, uh, what product do you have right now to tell people, oh, go, go to Quantum Lab, it's ready if you are interested in? Well, uh, so as I mentioned, uh, I think in response to Mariam's question uh, was that, you know, we are, we have basically decided to go with what the market asks us for, right? Uh, which also means that um, we are in a situation to ask for funding to do what they ask us to do. So this, you know, what I just mentioned to you is all possible right now, as soon as, you know, somebody says, okay, here's some money, you know, do what you have to do. Um, so, so uh, to answer your question, it's all doable. Just give me the money. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So we're looking for investors, of course. Is is the, is the you, a, a, a list of very inspiring ideas? Uh, really, I have to mention. Thank you. I appreciate that. Okay. Uh, I have a small question, uh, if that's okay. Uh, regarding, you know, the simulation of a nuclear vision and uh, calculating the minimum required mass, for example, for example, to to uh, to produce like uh, like an efficient amount of energy, um, how can we translate this problem into a quantum computer? I mean, the embedding here. How can we actually translate this into a quantum computer? Right. So, um, so the way. So this is why we're. I think. Um, if, if one wants to get into the details as you do, uh, Karim, uh, the dissertation I mentioned would be useful to look at. Uh, mm -hmm. The author of that dissertation is James Whitfield. Mm -hmm. And um, I can't remember the name of the dissertation. It came out of Harvard. So I think if you put it together, uh, mm -hmm. dissertation, James Whitfield, Harvard, uh, you'll get it. And the whole idea of, of James was to 
show how to take a problem from you know chemistry, classical chemistry, we can call it now, and convert it to a quantum circuit. Right. Mm -hmm. So once you have the quantum circuit, then uh, of course it'll be huge. <laughs> it's a difficult problem. Uh, but the point is that, you know, he also has some suggestions on how to do that in a way that, you know, it doesn't become too big and so forth. Uh, but but uh, to to kind of, you know, uh, going back to your question, that in itself is one thing that has to be done before it gets sent to the quantum computer, right? You will have to do some optimal circuit construction for the chemistry problem. And once you have that, then you can send it to your IBM, you know, uh, uh, Q quantum computer if it can take it. Mm -hmm. Or convert it to a annealing format and send it to some quantum annealer, right? Uh, which can take and work on that, uh, which requires you have to transform this into an icing format uh, and so forth. So, but but uh, I think the first step would be had to have a quantum circuit, which is a universal um, uh, design, right? So so that's how you would do it. Uh, I wonder if I address the question. Yeah, that, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I will, of course, I will look at it, the dissertation and read it carefully. Thank you. So the answer, the answer is in that dissertation. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. So uh, I think if we don't have any any more questions, uh, we will uh, leave Dr. Faisal to sleep, to have some sleep. <laughs> this is really late on, on his side. Uh, Wonderful. So uh, again, thank you, Dr. Faisal, for this really uh, uh, interesting talk and inspiring talk. Uh, and uh, we are looking forward for uh, your next talk in Hepatia or Hepatia series. Uh, and uh, thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you so much, Professor Yunus and Karim, for for inviting me. And uh, thank you for you know to the audience for attending and uh, you know some some good questions. I appreciate that. All the best. Thank you.